If you want to listen to this episode or any of our episodes ad-free, you can do that now. Head on over to Patreon. Click on the ad-free level. You get all of our bonus shows that you've been hearing so much about. Plus, every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you can listen to this episode or any of our other episodes at the same time, ad-free, over on Patreon. Hey guys, this is David. Welcome back behind the velvet rope. How is everybody doing? Let's get right into it today because we are joined by Linda Urkelishan from The Real Housewives of DC. How are you? Hi, David. I'm doing great. Thank you. When is the last time you got introduced as Linda from The Real Housewives of DC? It's been a while, at least at least two years. So here we are. How are you? Thank you for taking your time and sitting down with me. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm actually doing great considering that we're living in a self-isolating environment. Um, You know, I get to come into my office twice a week. I have a salt water fish tank, so I have to check my fish in my mail. I guess that's permitted. So, you know. Do you know that I love a fish tank? I love a fish tank. <laughs> I love my fish. It's it's there because of feng shui. Like when 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 Elizabeth, my partner, and I bought this little townhouse in Georgetown, we had a feng shui architect do the building, and he said I needed a water component, and I was like, yes, I want my saltwater fish. So it's what type of fish do you have in there? Oh my gosh. Well, I've learned the kind of fish not to have, which is the angel fish mm. because they try to eat everything else. But yeah, I've got a few little Nemos. See, and you only have to come once every two days. So this is why a fish tank is, I mean, to me, much more highly desirable than like a cat or dog, but that's just me. Right. And there's a secret. I also have a self feeder on my fish, oh. but I, I just, you know, I just, Maybe I use it as an excuse to get out of the house and come into the office. (laughs) Which is not so bad. So you are still running your modeling agency, the artist agency, right? Yes. This is our 35th year. Wow. Um, It was kind of a mind blower to have to celebrate our 35th year, you know, doing a virtual Zoom party, but it worked. We'll do what we have to. Seriously, are you from the D.C. area originally or? No, I actually grew up in South Georgia and I moved around a lot because my dad was military. And I thought after having moved nine times that I was going to pick a place that I loved, that I felt I could make my home. And D.C. was like a small town city when I moved here in 1977. So... I made it my home. I had all my children here and it's still my home. And you love DC. I do love DC. And how did you, how'd you get to owning a modeling agency, opening a modeling agency? How does that come about? Well, it usually most, most small business entrepreneurs start in general because there's a need. And I had been, Many, many years ago, I was a petite model, did a little bit of theater, and I loved doing like commercials, and I sang backup for Candy Staten for a while. And so I tried music, and I tried theater, and I tried all kinds of things, but I never found what I felt was a great agent for me. And so I became a stylist doing hair and makeup, and I I loved it. You know, I just, at my age, I had to go back you know, to get my cosmetology license in order to to go on location. But after my second child, my clients would call and say, who would you recommend? And I realized that there was a need for an agency to represent stylists. I didn't originally start as a modeling agency. It was a year later that I thought, hey, you know, I, this 
I might be okay at doing this. So yeah. And I loved it. I love representing people. And you just kind of figured out what to do (laughs) along the way. Well, I had a wonderful lawyer and I had a wonderful accounting firm. So I think if you, you know, he actually took me on pro bono because it was Sugar Ray Leonard, you, you know, the boxer. Yeah. So I used to be his stylist. And um, he said to me when I was going to open my business, you know, I really didn't have two nickels to rub together. And he goes, if you're really serious, he said, I would like to introduce you to Mike Trainer." So Mike Trainer was Ray Leonard's lawyer who became my lawyer and he did everything pro bono and he was an amazing guy. Wow. Yeah. So that's good. And here we are 35 years later. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm paying it forward. I guarantee you. (laughs) So now what happens during Corona, like to your business, like other than a zoom party, like how is your business, you know, like every business is affected. Like how is like, have you had a pivot? Like what's going on with that? Well, interestingly enough, all the all of the bookings were canceled after the first week of March. Many of our clients are the department stores like Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, etc. So all of that's on hold. We haven't seen any movement as far as runway starting again, probably not till August or September. And as far as print goes, we have had people reaching out to find out what kind of new protocol we're gonna have, what policies we're putting into place to protect our talent and to protect our stylist. So we're recommending that they take certification classes in, in hygiene and you know just getting used to what it's like to have to sanitize absolutely everything in front of you. Wow. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's definitely been a time to gather like our creative thoughts and try to figure out how to be, you know, to create collaborations without doing full on advertising jobs. So yeah, we're doing the best we can to, to stay in, you know, hang in there. But we were one of the fortunate small businesses in that we got approved for our SBA PPP loan. So that was a big deal. That's a big deal. Cause I have a lot of friends with small businesses, you know, and, like, I don't know what they're necessarily, you know, I mean, they're taking it one month at a time, but I think right. they're, they're quite worried. No, I mean, if things don't start to come back um, by August, then it's really going to become a financially, you know, stressed environment for, you know, I mean, it already is for our industry, but as far as our agency, we were very fortunate in that we had an extremely good year last year. And so that's being carried forward, but we definitely needed the help of the SBA. So that was great. So that's good. So, and like you said, you know, you're kind of taking this time to be like, think of creative things and like ways to move forward. So that's great. Right. So now let's go back to the beginning of the Real Housewives of DC. And then we're going to come more back to you. This isn't just about the show. Well, do you find that when you meet people like outside of your everyday life, is that all they want to talk to you about? You know, interestingly enough, because I'm in the modeling world, they they generally like everyone wants to know what it was like being a housewife. And the second question is, was it scripted? And the third question is, can I be a model? So it's sort of in that order, um, which is funny. But, um, you know, it was... It, it's something that is everlasting. Like Andy said to me once, I said, okay, so now I'm an ex-wife. He goes, once a wife, always a wife. That it's true. I mean, it really is true. Like, and we'll get into that, but like, you know, even with what they're doing now, like Anna King Conte is from like Real Housewives of Miami. Like she's doing, right. you know, like donate a dress. And cause I actually know her really well. She's like reached out to a lot of the wives uh-huh. and I mean, it's, yeah, because it was, it's for, to raise money. I forgot what charity it was, but it's like a charity all it's to go to help with Corona, you know, and she just, and she was on Real Housewives of Miami, which is not on there anymore. And, you know, people started getting back to her. It really is a community, like once a wife, always a wife. 
So being, you know, in DC for a long time, like when they were first casting this show, like, do you remember when they were casting it? Like, was there a buzz around town? Like, was there like, oh, this show is coming to town? Like, or was there none of that? It was kind of quiet, quiet. Well, there was a buzz that there was somebody casting for a show in DC, but it never occurred to me that they were interested in me or that it was a housewife show. And honestly, we didn't even find out that it was a housewife show till at the very, very end. You know, they, you know, lots of that. And, you know, the people who would say to me, would you ever consider it? I go consider what, you know, because in addition to having four kids and the modeling agency, I also am an executive director for the James and Paula Coburn Foundation, and that's on behalf of the late actor James Coburn. So that was a huge job flying back and forth and, you know, running the trust and taking care of the foundation. So I didn't really think that I would have enough time to devote to being a housewife. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, did you watch any Bravo before this? Like, were you a huge fan of the Housewives or other Bravo shows? I loved Project Runway. That was my first show. You know, I loved Project Runway. And I had never seen any of the Housewives shows, unfortunately. But as soon as, I think it was somebody in my family, when I said, you know, people keep reaching out, they want to do a a casting reel. And I was like, and they were like, Oh my God, you've never seen the housewives. I mean, there's like this huge fan base of housewife followers. And I was like, no, I haven't. So the first episode of housewives was New Jersey for me that I got to see because that's what was airing at the time that they were doing casting in DC. So, you know what that was like, right? I mean, oh yeah, it was, (laughs) it was like, I thought to myself, well, wow, you know, like I need some disclaimers here, but you know, after, you know, I'm talking to the producers at Half Yard and feeling like they, they were listening to each of us and, and what, what were our concerns and what would it take to, to get us on board type of thing. I think they worked with each of us individually and they really did address all the concerns that I had and I felt safe becoming a housewife. That's good. And obviously you watch Project Runway because you know, that ties into your business. So, I mean, that's like a, I mean, those were like the beginning days of Bravo, like Queer Eye and Project Runway. Right. Those were good days. So who came to, it was someone in your family that came and said, Oh, I heard someone's casting and you might be good for this show. No, actually clients of mine had recommended me um, because I work with a lot of PR firms and most of the top PR people were reached out to and they were like, who do you know that's, that you think would, you know, I guess be, be appropriate for this show. And again, they weren't even telling them what it was, but I think, really, David, that it has a lot to do with my industry. You know, I think that people wanted politics in Washington, but they weren't getting it. So if they had to, if they had to, you know, pivot and take, you know, Capitol Hill out of it, I mean, who knew what was going to happen? But anyway, yeah, but you know, I think then they were like, okay, let's find, you know, multiple layers in the city from the fashion industry to, you know, with Stacy, it was real estate. With Mary, it was, you know, interior design and her charities. And Kat was, you know, the first time I ever met Kat, we were on camera. And, you know, she became a really terrific friend. And, and we realized halfway through our filming that we had never been off camera as friends wow. like we had never been off camera as friends every time we saw each other we were on camera wow and so well that's that's interesting and so this show that started when they were casting it like you said it wasn't supposed to be housewives like did they give you a working title and did they want it to be about politics like was their initial goal like 
let's find five women very politically charged, either like Republican, Democrat, but that are very into the political sector? That was the rumor. The rumor was, you know, um, we really would like it to be, we would like people to be close to politics, which, you know, it's just, it's not something that's ever going to happen in a reality environment because it's not just what you do. Like I learned very early on, like I thought, well, wait a minute, I can be responsible for me. Like if I, if I know what I'm up against and I have to be my authentic self and I'm going to say things that maybe are misconstrued and, you know, as well as I do that, you know, the whole social media world, we were just getting on Twitter. We were just getting on Facebook. Um, and as many fans as you have or as many haters as you can attract. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not the easiest um, commitment to make. No, it's not. And I agree with you. I mean, I would think like getting five people to go deep on politics you know, just for like confidentiality. And like, I mean, if you're really in that inner circle, you probably can't be on a TV show no matter even if you wanted to. Right. I mean, and there, I mean, also there are a lot of buildings in the city that don't allow filming. So there's, you know, there's a lot of of people that just aren't able, even if they wanted to. So I think it's important when Bravo goes out there that they find people that have a storyline that, you know, they can follow for four months and, you know, continue to think about what will the next season represent. And in our case, they were, you know, had every intention of a second season because our producers would say, mark that, you know, mark that film there because then we're going to follow up, you know. And it was, you know... I know you haven't gotten there yet, but it's like, it was, I think, devastating to be the first of the series of Housewives to just basically be canceled after one season. And it was clear to all of us, basically, That's it was pretty lie. clear what, what had gone down. Yeah, which I have so much to ask about and to say about that. So... Then you were cast and like, as they were casting it, they realized, okay, it's not going to be about politics. It'll be more, you know, we have like the modeling industry, the PR industry, real estate, we have some different industries. So when did it become, I mean, when you started filming, was there like a working title? Was it still not Housewives? Like, when did you find out, oh, wait a second, this is going to be Housewives? And how was the show pitched to you if it wasn't Housewives? It was pitched almost as, you know, we're going to be doing a variety show, maybe cooking, maybe this or that. And I actually signed my contract on the on my car on the first night of filming at Ted Gibson's opening of his salon. in oh, wow. So literally it was like, it is Housewives. Here we go. And here's your contract. And it was like, you cannot be you cannot be in this in the opening of Ted Gibson's, you know, show, if you don't sign here. And I, it isn't like I hadn't reviewed it or I hadn't had a lawyer review it, but it would officially became a housewife show very quickly. It was like helicopters landing, sirens going off. It was like, okay, here you go. Were you like upset you know like that first night where the other girls I mean I don't know if you know about the other girls like was everyone kind of like oh god we didn't want this to be housewives we wanted like a nice little show no we all wanted it to be housewives I mean every one of us we we knew that the brand of housewives even though there were only um I guess at the time the OC in New Jersey it was you could tell that if you I mean I think it's kind of like I guess we believed that we could be true to our city and that every city, every franchise is different. And so we thought, okay, we're going to make ours sophisticated. <laughs> we're not going to, you know, like toss tables and we're not going to pull hair. And But the truth is, you know, um, there's a lot of tension that brews. 
Oh yeah. You're just like, okay, I saw New Jersey. This isn't New Jersey. And we'll just do this housewives thing and we're DC and we'll be sophisticated. We'll be so sophisticated. <laughs> and I mean, I could see you guys all saying that, you know, and Bravo is probably just like, yeah, we've been at this a little longer than all of you and go right ahead. Right. So who did you really know beforehand? Like not Kat, I know. Like, did you know everyone else? Like, did you know, um, all the others, like Mary, Stacy, and Michaela? Mary was the only person that I was friends with. I knew Michaela from years ago. Like, Michaela and I had a history. Um, we met at a hair salon. We'd sit next to each other having our color done. Um, she became involved in doing a polo match and, and wanted to book our models. So we had a history. Michaela and I, unfortunately, when she met Tark, he kind of, you know, swooped her up, moved her to the, the winery, and his secretary held her cell phone. Uh, so it was really hard to actually continue a relationship with Michaela. So Mary and I were definitely, you know, friends we were working on a lot of different charities together and and we we lived you know did close. you know Michaela was going to be part of the show like before that I, first night oh wow well I found out that afternoon actually what's so crazy is the timing of this interview because it was probably like this day 10 years ago I was out in front of Bloomingdale's picking up cosmetics for a beauty within event that we do for Mother's Day for the homeless women in shelters. And I was sitting outside of Bloomingdale's waiting for everybody to load my car and I get a call from the producer in New York. And she says, you're in, here's the list of girls that are doing it. And when she said her name, I immediately said, there is no way on God's green earth that I am filming with her. I am not doing it. They are crazy people. And she goes, now, Linda, calm down. <laughs> calm down. I was like, no, because you don't know these people. Like I've had a lot of experience and they're not, they're, they're not authentic. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. And she was like, you know, well, would you be willing to film with them if it weren't on their property? Like, what if it's at Paul Wharton's birthday party? And I said, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a bitch about it. You know, if in fact they're present, that's fine. If other people in our group want them present, then fine. But for me, I'm not filming on their property because everybody knows that I've had issues and it would not be authentic to me to pretend that now all of a sudden we're bosom buddies again. Yeah. So. Did anyone ask you in casting, like, you know, because I know like, for instance, from New Jersey, some of the casting, like they purposely, for lack of a better word, cast certain people because of that, because of these like pre existing relationships Did like, do they ever ask you? Cause this process isn't usually like here you are and you're hired and you start tomorrow. You know, you have to have a few interviews. Did anyone ever ask you like, by the way, do you know this woman, Kat, do you know this woman, Michaela? And just pushing it really. You know, the only, the only people I knew that they were casting along with me was Mary Amons and a very good friend of mine, Deborah Cockstein, who's an interior designer well, she's an architect and she has a store or had a store in Georgetown. And so they put the three of us together at dinner to see how we interacted. And interestingly enough, um, Deborah is incredible and just so much fun, but they couldn't understand a word she was saying. Mm -hmm. So they were like, we're going to have to subtitle her. And this was before they were willing to do subtitles. So, you know, I wish that she had been part of the show because she was hilarious and beautiful and talented. And she was a great friend of Mary and mine. So it, it was, that part was disappointing, but I didn't know, I'd never heard of Stacy, never met her. She's much younger, was living in a totally different world. Um, Kat, I had never met her. So, you know, really it was shocking when I found out that 
Mikhail and her husband, because it's never just Mikhail. It's Mikhail and... Right. I wonder if they asked her, you know, if somehow they brought you up to her. I don't know. I don't know. Throughout this whole process. And they would probably, I mean, now they use subtitles, so... It oh, could have yeah, been I mean, of totally. course. <laughs> It, it, I mean, today it's 2020. So, you know, I mean, it could have been cast totally differently. Yeah. So right there in that first scene was when you and Mikhail kind of, and I'm sure she was like not thrilled either. Cause you know, you kind of knew her right. from the past and, you know, knew where some of her skeletons were and the bodies were buried. I mean, we saw right away, you know, were you telling her she needs to eat and she's too skinny. She, she didn't need to eat. And she was not pleased with that. No. <laughs> I mean, and that really became, oh, so, I mean, I think the thing with DC for me, like looking back at it, you know, there was almost like, well, for, there was almost like three overlying themes, I think. There was this underlying racism discussion, which we've seen on other housewives now. Right. I mean, do you guys think that that would ever become part of the show and I'm not even saying I agree or you know what I mean where like Stacy thought that like there was some racism being thrown in her direction and I mean did anyone foresee any of that as being part of the storyline no I don't think so I think in Washington we're a melting pot it just it doesn't you know I think that that came out of nowhere frankly I I I, I think so and then, you know, it was political. Like, even though you guys weren't in politics, we saw, like, political... It was like a political right. atmosphere. You know, I mean, it's it's interesting. Like, do you ever think about, would this show be completely different today? I mean, you know, as opposed to, like, Obama just getting in office, like, now, in, like, a Trump regime, like, this show would be so different. Like, do you ever think about that? And do you think it would have been more successful or you know if the Salahis were there the end result might have been the same regardless well I honestly feel that had the show have had like a second and third and fourth season there's a lot there's just so many things that have transpired in DC DC is like an incredible it's our nation's capital for goodness sakes so many things you know happen from this little nucleus called our city <laughs> Our capital. Yeah. But I really, I think it would have been, I mean, a lot of, there were a lot of things that have taken place, but DC would not have it, you know? And I think that, I know you know Andy and this probably the whole story, but, you know, they really had to sign off on that. There were a lot of, lot of issues with the White House. A lot of, yeah. and rightfully so. I mean, when you think about the fact that Obama was having his first state dinner and Jason Baki and, and Ted Gibson are invited through the kitchen with the Salahis to go to the Black Caucus dinner. I mean, that was crazy enough. And we already knew about that. And I was doing a fashion show at Union Station with Burkina Faso. And I took their photographs and handed them to the body guards and the ushers and said, if these people show up, do not let them in my door because they, they were, they were crashers. They didn't have invitations. They didn't, their storyline was made up minute by minute. Oh, Hey, let's go do that. You know, and it works for them or it worked for them, you know, but it was really like an underlying stress in the show from the very beginning. As Valentine's Day quickly approaches, I think of love and romance and everything else. And that's what makes me think of Dipsy. Dipsy Stories is an app full of sexy audio stories. And now they even have brand new written stories. No matter who you're into or what turns you on, Dipsy helps bring the stories to life anytime, anywhere. Trust me, I was like, let me just listen to this for a few minutes Oh my God, you get sucked into these stories. I was just listening to a girl who was getting a tattoo and well, I mean, her and the tattoo artist, I'm sure you could imagine what happens next. 
So close your eyes and let yourself get lost in a world where only good things happen and pleasure is your only priority. Explore your fantasies in a safe, shame-free way. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash velvet. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash velvet. Dipsystories.com com slash velvet. I stare at my smile all day doing these Zooms recording this podcast, and I love it. But what I don't love is the toxic ingredients in most dental care products. They're not good for my health or my teeth. I want products that are best for my oral health and products made with natural ingredients. That's why I use Lumino. Lumino makes toothpaste, mouthwash, and whitening products that actually help your oral health instead of hurting it. Everything they use is certified non-toxic. Lumino's whitening strips are super effective and perfect for sensitive teeth. It only takes 30 minutes to apply and you'll see results in 7 days. Listen, I've got the before and after pics to prove it. And I love how my smile feels and looks. And I know you'll love Lumino as much as I do too. Get 15% off your order today by going to getlumino.com slash velvet and use code velvet. That's G-E-T-L-U-M-I-N-E-U-X dot com slash velvet. Code velvet to save 15%. Getlumino.com slash velvet. I'm not such a great cook, and I find cooking even harder when I also want to eat well and healthy. Well, guess what? None of that matters anymore because I found Green Chef. With fresh produce, premium proteins, and organic ingredients you can trust, Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Their pre-made and pre-measured sauces, dressings, and spices make it so easy. I personally turn to Green Chef because they have carb-conscious and calorie-conscious options. But they cover it all, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free. That's right, I can keep going. Green Chef has it all. And you avoid the long lines at the grocery store. Green Chef is delivered right to your door with easy-to-follow recipes. Go to greenchef.com slash velvet130 and use code velvet130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. That's right. Go to greenchef.com slash velvet130 and use code velvet130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. It is so freaking cold this winter in New York City and my skin has been so dry and so dehydrated. That is until I discovered Whey. Whey's new body cream and body cleanser is amazing. It's hydrating, it's skin softening, and it comes in the iconic Whey fragrance, Melrose Place. It's only the best TV show ever, but listen, the smell is so good. It has notes of bergamot, lychee, cedarwood, and white musk, and it works so fast. It nourishes your skin when you need it most, and it prevents dryness. I don't know what I would do without my Whey Melrose Place. Listen, experience the new Whey Melrose Place body cream and body cleanser. Your body your way. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com and use code VELVETROBE to get 15% off your entire purchase. That's 15% off your entire order at T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com, code VELVETROBE. Your skin will thank you later. If you're anything like me, you get bored with your workout so quickly. Well, the Peloton Bike and Bike Plus are ringing in the new year with so much new, new classes, new music, and new ways to keep your workouts fun and motivating. I love that Peloton has added boxing. And even if you've never boxed before, these classes are awesome. They help you work up a sweat while working on the fundamentals of form, footwork, and fun combos. I love that the daily workouts have such variety. The best thing I like about Peloton is the new artist series music selections. You can work out to music of a single artist for an entire class, but Peloton also has rock, pop, hip hop, EDM. Now for a limited time, try the Peloton app free for 12 months, then $12.99 a month after. New members only. Visit onepeloton.com slash app to learn more. That's two months free at O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. The offer expires 131 
2022. Terms apply. I have to tell you about a new nutritional product that I started using called Athletic Greens. Now, I started taking Athletic Greens because I wanted better gut health, I wanted more energy, and I wanted to optimize immune system. Well, let me tell you, what I love best about Athletic Greens is it's easy. I personally don't have, didn't have, and never will have time for any nutritional product that is complicated to use. So here's the thing. Athletic Greens, you take one scoop and you add eight ounces of water and that's all you need. Also, the other thing I love about Athletic Greens, it actually tastes great and it's inexpensive. It costs less than $3 a day. Also, I love it. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMO. So there's no nasty chemicals or anything artificial. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash velvet. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash velvet to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Do you guys do what I do every January? First, you think about the year prior of all the things you didn't accomplish that you wanted to. Then you make a bunch of New Year's resolutions. And as soon as you break them, you feel bad about yourself. Well, get out of your mind. Let me tell you, therapy can help you learn to be kinder and gentler to yourself and help you move forward. I have to tell you guys about Talkspace. Talkspace has been a miracle for me. First of all, they match you with a licensed therapist that you can connect with not only from your computer, but from your phone anywhere on the go. I also love that Talkspace focuses on your schedule. They fit your schedule, not the other way around. With live chat, video, and audio sessions, you could easily fit mental health into your daily routine. I also love that your information is extremely private and it's just between you and your therapist. Listen, Talkspace can help you with anything, anxiety, depression, self-doubt, make your mental health more than just another New Year's resolution with Talkspace. Visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code VELVET at sign up. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com, promo code VELVET. I mean, you think, I mean, they came with an agenda, like we're going to be famous, we're going to create a storyline. What can we do week to week to stand out? and be presented in a certain light. Yeah, I mean, definitely. (laughs) Was there anyone else, was everyone else authentic or did anyone else come with like, hey, I want to be famous, there are cameras, I got my agenda? I honestly, I feel like I didn't, I got the feeling, like I love Stacey, but I got the feeling a third of the way in that she didn't really want to be there. You know, I mean, I just... It was a it was a lot. She had small children. She had kind of bit off maybe more than she wanted to chew. Then I think there was, you know, there was some ill feelings between her and Kat. So, you know, it's just I think that um, I think that Stacy would have probably liked to have bowed out. And, you know, I even actually spoke with Andy at one time and said, it's almost impossible for five people to carry that show. Like you need like some subhead, you know, help. like there needs to be either more housewives because like I could only film four days a week. And then when I was in LA, like 10 days out of the month, they would have to do all my interviews, like one right after the other, so that I could catch up. And I felt bad that I couldn't be more present, but you know, it's a lot when you really do have a job. But I think, I think everyone was authentic with the exception of the Salahis because, I mean, they did have a great story. He, owned, you know, his family owned the winery. They did wonderful things for charity, the polo, you know, big fashion show and the polo match. I mean, all of that was a great storyline, but I think that the way, the way it was handled was not authentic. Right. And kudos to you for letting, I mean, for being hired. Cause I don't even think you'd be hired now. Cause now there's no four days a week. Now it's like, I think it's six or it's definitely at least five, but I think it's six that it's like, you need two days off, like next. Good right. luck. Well, so. I was, you know, David, I was so lucky because they were willing to make the majority of wh- who I was on the show about the business that I'm in. 
you know? Yeah. So it was, it was interesting to the viewer to see a go see, to watch a fashion show being produced to, you know, something totally different in DC. You're lucky. Cause I mean, I know I've talked to housewives that are not on anymore. And that's one of their biggest complaints is like, I signed up because I was promised I could talk about my business and my business was like edited to the down to the floor and they never, you know, I mean, and also I think, you know, having a modeling agency, like that's interesting for housewife viewers. So right. that was, I think really good for you was filming. Like how was filming like Salah? He's aside for a minute. Like, was it what you expected? Like, were there any differences in filming? Like how was the actual filming process? Well, I, I was super lucky to have Matt Cohen as my PA and I loved him. And Kat and I were teamed together with Matt. The production team was just fabulous, like very professional. It was, it was so much more than I had anticipated. It was, it was really very well run, very professional, very respectful. Um, yeah, and I, I just think that there were, I opted to do 12 hour days to have four days, you know, to only be on four days a week because I really needed to work. I mean, I was still running a company and I still had, you know, two children that were under 16. So yeah, I had a lot going on. And then this whole thing with the Salahi. So, I mean, this happened really like during or before film, like this, this whole, well, well, Okay, so this with the Salahis, I mean, that happened during filming. I think what a lot of people don't know is, you know, the big, like, they crashed the White House. That wasn't the first time, like, to your point. I mean, it kind of kept happening. Right. Well, the the actual White House crashing happened... Towards the end, As right? we were, we were, we were basically shutting down production to go right. on Thanksgiving break. And that's when it happened. So it was... It was like a whirlwind. A whirlwind that was then heard all around the world. All so, I mean, around the world. So, I mean, at this point, you personally had already had your issues with Michaela. Like, A, you didn't even want her on the show. Once you found out she was coming on, you didn't even want to go on. B, you guys had, she got upset with you because you told her she needs to eat because she was too thin. You know, then we saw some issues at the winery. You know, who really, what's... Is this a legitimate winery and who owns what? So, I mean, here you are filming this show. You know, you're working four days a week, fitting it into your busy schedule. You know, and at least you guys are probably feeling good. Like you have a show you're making, you know, whether there's drama or however it's going to be edited. And then this happens almost towards the end. And now it's Thanksgiving break. Like, what was that like? It was somber. I mean, all of us were, were basically asked to come back um, because they needed to try to, to have a conversation with Mikhail and Tart. They, you know, so Stacy volunteered and, and Kat to be the two people that would go to Stacy's house, Stacy and Jason's house and try to find out what in the world happened, you know? So there needed, you know, of course we had a beginning and a middle, but we had no end. And I don't think that any of us wanted to just be, you know, just go dark at the end. So in order to finish it up, we all had to continue filming. And I remember having everybody come over to the house and, you know, you saw, we watched the, you know, I plead the fifth all day and, you know, we just had to wrap it up and we knew, I mean, but it was, we were all in shock. I don't think, that anybody knew as, as crazy as the behavior had been in the past, that anybody would push themselves into a actual white house party. Like, Where you're not, not invited. No. That's not easy, you know, at all. So that was really that we were all in shock. I mean, it just, it was bad. Yeah. I mean, they just basically walked into a white house party that they were not invited to, which I don't know. Why do you think they did that? I think because they had gotten away in the past and not just for Housewives or Bravo. I think that they had spent so many years 
like making things up as they go. And there are people like that. I mean, I'm just thrilled for Mikhail that she got out of town. She's happily married. I think that she's with, you know, in a much healthier place, but you know, he was a scary guy, that guy. (laughs) You think it was mostly his influence over her taking the cell phone away, like kind of pulling her away to the country. I mean, there was a time when all of us sat down, you know, as a group with when she wasn't present and wanted to do an intervention to just let her know that we were there for her because we felt that she was there was an underlying bullying going on with him. And we had an incident at the upfronts in L.A. where he pushed her. He and I had a screaming match like Unfortunately, the next, you know, we had the view, we had to fly in for the view and that became the main source of conversation and that kind of upset Whoopi Goldberg. And I I don't even know if you've seen all that on YouTube, but um, it was just one crazy thing after another. I mean, it's just, it was an, it was a maddening time. So you saw him actually push her at the The whole table. The whole table saw it. Like two producers for Bravo were sitting right across from him and he was going after them. He pushed her. She was trying to calm him down. And it was Kat's, it was the eve of Kat's birthday. We're all the way at the end of the table. I'm trying to get as far away from him as I can. And, you know, he, he threw a glass of wine at me and I threw water back at him and it just, you know, and then after that, the producers finally, I guess, communicated with Andy and everybody else that they felt nervous for their lives. And, and so he was at that point sequestered away from us. We, it, we were just separated from like from the rest of the, the publicity, all of our upfront interviews, everything was done separate. It was, it was, a, I'm sure it was the first for Bravo and, you know, they did what they had to do, which is cancel our show, but they were yeah. tested on all fronts. And that's like during the upfront. So it's not being filmed. Like this isn't like, let's turn it on for the cameras. This is like, exactly. we're all doing press. And he was just, you don't even know what it was. He was just upset about something. Well, we found out that it was something that had to do with, he wasn't invited he wasn't invited to walk the red carpet or whatever for the upfronts. I, I don't know. And he, but what happens is with, with him, unfortunately, you know, when he starts drinking, you just don't know who he's going to become. And that night he became, you know, abusive. Wow. Wow. And you don't see him like, is he still, I mean, oh. now that they're, no. <laughs> Is he even on the circuit? Like, is he in D.C. or you don't even know? Somebody told me they saw him on Tinder. And I was like, well, I thought he just got married like four months ago, you know. But I wish him well. I wish everyone well. I have no ill will towards them. But, you know, as far as the show was concerned, when we started it, as you know, the first season is always the Rocky, the Rocky part, developing right. characters, who stays, who goes. And, you know, not to be able to continue what we started when you work that hard, it was, it was a big disappointment. And yes, I forever will know that it was their shenanigans that got us canceled. And like when you guys went home for that Thanksgiving break or you had it, like, I mean, and producers were like, put a pause on it. Was there ever a fear amongst you guys of like, this show may never even see the light of day. Like this whole thing might be shut down right now. Um, I think maybe for a week, you know, and that was when all of our film was sequestered and they looked, you know, because the FBI wanted to see if Bravo had anything to do with it at all. And so they, you know, went through our film like a fine tooth comb, but I knew as did everyone else, Bravo had nothing to do with that. Like they didn't, you know, I think that they knew that they were, you know, when they weren't producing an invitation or they weren't being up front, I think that Bravo started to get suspicious, but I don't think that they thought that they would ever get past the first person. Right. 
Because it's good TV and drama until now we have the FBI involved. Then Brad right. was probably like, holy shit, this is <laughs> not a joke anymore. No. So the it FBI actually, money. it costs, right, it costs a lot. And the FBI actually came in and had a look at all the footage. All of it. They took all the film. So, yeah, you wondered. But, I mean, fortunately for, for Bravo, they were able to air it because it had been talked about throughout the world. It was, it was a big deal. So, you know, for them, I think that's the least that they felt they could do. You know what I mean? I mean, that's kind of how they were able to get their, not revenge, but, you know, like I remember the reunion. We had like a 14-hour reunion And it was because Andy, under contract, had the right to ask as many questions as he wanted, unlike when they were before a court of law and they kept saying, I'm plead the fifth. Andy was in a unique situation where he could actually ask Michaela, were you a cheerleader? Were you this? Were you that? You know, he had his, you know, he had his list of things and he wanted the, he wanted the, you know, the followers of Housewives to see that this was not something that Bravo created in their mind. You know, we're not scripted, even though people still think that we are. It is not scripted. And, you know, it, I think that that was Andy's moment during the reunion to be able to, like, really try to stop the world from spinning. Yeah, and do you think, so you think they're doing this and crashing was just because they got away in the past? Like, or do you think some of that was, oh, there's also cameras on us and Bravo's here. Now we really want to do it. Like, do you think that played into it or now they just felt entitled to go to a party I don't, with Obama? Yeah, cameras are never allowed. Like, the first person that looked at their IDs, you know, and it's pouring down rain and all of that, the cameras had to be turned away. So at that point, that's when Bravo packed up and, and, you know, the production company went on its merry way for us all to wake up the next morning with, you know, all the photographs with, yeah, the president, the vice president. (laughs) I mean, were you just shocked? I mean, like your whole show was literally hijacked by like one, like just what a dark cloud to have hanging over the show. Like, I mean, everyone in the world was talking about this. Right. No. Well, yes, it was, um, it, it was like somebody hit me with a stun gun because even as well as I knew them, I didn't think they were capable of that. I just don't know how you can do this more than once and not get arrested. <laughs> There's, trust me. I mean, You know, there were just all kinds of things. I just feel like they lived beyond their means. They made it up as they went along. I mean, if you watch the reunion, you see Andy shows the casting reel. They did that in somebody else's house that wasn't even home, that didn't even know they were there. You know, I mean, crazy stuff like that. Who who goes into somebody else's house and films a casting reel? Yeah, it, it's you know, I didn't even know about that because I had never been asked to do a casting reel. I had been, you know, they came in and filmed at my apartment. So they did that. But I guess earlier they had made their own casting reel and sent it in. Right. That's really strange. I mean, especially <laughs> since like if you get hired, they're going to want to see your house. I mean, I guess if it's far enough in the future it'll just be like okay we have a new house now but if the other house was a mansion and this one is small like I I don't understand the thought process there either well I don't think anybody ever really got to the root of what what drove them or why they were who they were I mean I think Bravo like is still looking for drama in their in their shows but I think they know when to, like, when to stop for the crazies. Yeah, and this probably changed a lot of things. Like, I imagine the whole White House has different, I mean, they have a lot of different protocol now anyway, but they probably have a lot of different protocol just from the Salahis. I I feel quite certain the contracts changed. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, I guess, is that really in your opinion, or is that the just... 
that's why the show didn't continue. It really was like, what, there was too much liability because of this, this act that was just felt around the world and the FBI was involved in the White House and the president and the vice president. Is that really why you think the show didn't come back and continue or? No, I don't know for a fact, but even Andy has said in his book, you know, like when you've got the FBI on your back and you're spending all this money and you're trying to defend yourself, like we just had to go away. But I actually thought it was because there was a merger that had been taking place between Universal and Comcast right in the middle of the merger is when this happened. And Bravo was a real, you know, it was a big deal with the merger and all the backlash that was happening, you know, that was also a piece of the pie. So I think that in order for the merger to continue, it was like, can we please sign off on the crazies? I mean, that makes sense. You know, like, look, there's been a bunch of situations in Housewives history that are just larger than the show. You know, like Russell right. Armstrong, like took his own life, like from Beverly oh, right. Hills, like that's, you know what I mean? Were these things that cause you to like step out of the show and say like, this is real life, you know, like even like New Jersey, like Teresa and Melissa, like these families, right. this is like, this is not TV here. This is like reality, you know, in such a grand level. Like that's how I really kind of summarize the Real Housewives of DC. Like this is no joke. The FBI is, is involved with Bravo now, people. Right. No. So I think that they, you know, well, now they have Real Housewives of Potomac. So they get they get to film in D.C. and they, you know, right. they were able to develop, um, you know, a cast that they felt was, I think, m- more in keeping with what the fans were asking for, too. Like they thought that our show was too white. It just was, you know, in the District of Columbia, there was a lot of backlash over that. And I think that they kept that in mind when they were casting for Potomac. Yeah. Although it's really funny because like, A, you know, you talk about subtitles and now like in Dallas last season, they had Carrie Brigham who was subtitled. <laughs> Everyone is thrilled with Garcelle and Beverly Hills because now like it's a racially diverse cast. Well, you guys kind of had a racially diverse cast with Stacey. So it's like, you know, it's like, right. I think in a lot of ways, the Real Housewives of DC was kind of ahead of its time. Were you ever, like, was there ever any animosity between you or, like, the other girls with, like, well, why aren't we in, in Potomac? Like, why why didn't they just bring back D.C.? Like, why are they making a whole new show called Real Housewives of Potomac? Why not that's us? A, I think that's an interesting question, but I think they had to make it their own. You know, they really needed to do that. If I were a producer, I would not have done it any other way because I think that... So many people wanted Washington to return. We still have fans. I love them so much. I mean, I'm just, I can't even believe how much love and support there is. And and I feel like they would have been expecting like people from DC on that show. And then it would have been, oh, here's DC again, but they're doing it in Potomac. So it would have, it, it just would never have had a chance to become its own entity in the housewife world. That makes sense. Do you know any of the Potomac girls, like Karen Huger, Giselle, any of them? Well, I actually knew Robin because she worked with TAAPR, which is a big firm that we work with um, in Washington. So I knew Robin and I had maybe met Katie a couple of times, um, but... All I knew was she was dating my former financial advisor. And I was like, what? (laughs) So it was a little crazy. But, you know, I think that like I think that like Miami, um, it it got better in the second season, you know, and talk about subtitles. We had lots of subtitles in Miami, you know, and I loved it. I mean, I I, like I said, I wish my friend Deborah could have been a part of the show. Like if we could have switched out Deborah for Michaela we'd still be on. (laughs) Seriously. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, it could have been. And I think like as a viewer, you watch the first season and yeah, you usually fall in love in the second season. It really, you need that second season to be like, oh, I'm learning more about this particular person. It's hard to really get to know someone, I think, in one season. Yeah, because they're developing your character. They have to give all your background. They have, or not all, but they, they're, they're developing you. And so really, when you hit the second season, 
you hit the ground running because they already know who you are. Right. What's the climate like? I mean, it's so much different now, like in Washington now, like these days. I mean, even pre-corona, you know, I mean, I know what the country, you know, I mean, it's, it's all politics these days, which is why I think now if they were to do this show, would it just, I mean, all, all like then nobody wanted to really talk about politics on the Real Housewives of DC. Now it's all anyone wants to talk about prior to Corona. I know. Well, it's kind of a dreadful feeling in DC right now for me, you know, I was a Republican my whole life and I vote for, I always would vote based on who I felt would be the best president. So of course I voted for Obama. I love Obama. Um, I left, (laughs) I left my party when Trump won because I just thought it was not going to suit me in the future that, that, that just was not going to be the right party for me. So I'm a Democrat, but I look at the Democrats and I feel they struggle to find their way you know, there's there's just so many things that I wish that the Democrats would do uh, differently. So I'm 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 as a as a as a person in this country, I really wish we had a new party. Period. <laughs> like something that had the values of less red tape, and you know, but take care of your own. We're all one on on the planet you know, climate change, all of that. Like, I I love the Democrats' agenda, but it's how do they get it, you know, how do they how do they get it actually to work? And you've got somebody like Trump who is less than desirable. And it's just, I feel like, you know, I feel like he's a lot like the Salahis. That's a comparison I haven't heard before. I don't know if may- maybe the Salahis would enjoy that comparison. I'm not sure. I actually, because I went to a Journey concert like five years ago. So, I mean, I was in the front row and like right there in front of me behind the barrier. I was right. like, oh my God, there's Michaela. I know, but she's really happy. I mean, she's-, she's really happy and he loves her with all of his heart and soul and he protects her. He doesn't. You know, like I think after what she went through and all the things that she has to live with, that um, she deserved that. She deserved. She went that. from that to being on tour with Journey. Like that's not so right. bad. No, she it's was beautiful. In, she was in jeans. She was wearing like a rocker T-shirt. I'm like, I think she's doing okay now. No, she is doing yeah. really well, and I'm really happy for her. What about? Do you talk to Cat, Stacy, Mary? Yes, we were all going to have a reunion. I mean, we were talking about I doing know. a reunion and Kat's father was put in the hospital and passed away about 30 days ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that kind of put a kibosh, maybe even a little bit longer. This coronavirus, I have to tell you, I was in Los Angeles for the foundation and I was there for almost, I guess, like six weeks because I also went to a big conference in San Diego then the coronavirus hits and I'm like, oh my God, I got to get home. Like I have to really get home. Right. But yeah, it's. What's, I mean, what are your, I mean, hopefully we're going to be somewhat back to normal eventually. Yeah, we're taking, you know, I feel really hopeful. I have a very positive attitude about it. I do feel that Um, that we're at a time where Mother Nature basically said, I will have no more of this. No one's listening. You know, there is climate change. You're destroying my rainforest. You're doing everything wrong. Like you're living, there was just so much greed and so much, um, it it just, we were so disconnected as 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 a globe, you know, as a global world, we were disconnected. And I think that this is bringing us all together. If you look at the silver lining, the gift is that we are thinking of each other. We are being kind to one another and we needed that. I think so. I mean, hopefully this will change people if they needed that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I was always one of those people who 
appreciated life. Like I never really took a day for granted. You know, now granted, I could probably put my phone down more when I'm out with people. So maybe that's what I'll work on. And instead of throwing myself into my Instagram, I'll relate to you as a human being when you're sitting in front of me. That's what I'm going to try to take away from it. But, you know, I mean, hopefully there'll be that positive aspect from all of this. I mean, we are seeing that with all this negative, you know, all it, there's always, I, I just believe in, in that yin yang theory of life. And, you know, we didn't know what was coming and we still don't know how long it's going to last, but I know, I know that we just all have to do our part, stay home, keep washing our hands and, yeah, you know, social distance. That's really all there is to do. Yeah. Do you have any plans after this or it's just really going to be just throw, like go right back to work? No, I, I you know, what's interesting is I, because it's Cinco de Mayo, I'm going to go with my stepdaughter and we're going to have margaritas at, at my apartment and we're going to, I'm going to have a taco salad and celebrate. That's nice. That's very nice. And I am, when this is over, I'm going to be traveling a lot in the U.S. Hopefully I will be in D.C. That's my plan. And we need to have drinks together. When oh, that I happens. love that. <laughs> That's, I, I like told Mary I was going to come see her. And she was like, so I'm like, we need to go out also. Yes. I mean, and Paul Wharton's here, you know, so we'll all come out together. with us. Yeah. What's your, before we go, what is, I mean, your children are all well. Are they all like there too? They're all local. You are so kind. All my kids are doing really well. I have a son in London in school, so he's coming home the 14th of May and I can't wait for him to get home. And um, really I have my first grandchild who's like a little over a year old. So my life is just really solid. Everyone is healthy and you know, once I can get back to work, the business is solid. And I just have a lot to be grateful for. I have wonderful friends, wonderful family. And, and That's now good. I know you, David. We're, we're going to listen. We're going to keep in touch. I'm very good at keeping in touch with people. Excellent. Either on email or DM. You seem to be good at both. So where can everyone find you on Instagram? Uh, the real Linda DC. That's and, easy to remember. Uh, yeah. Well, that was because when we first were doing Twitter, David, I had two uh, imposters because I, I didn't know how to do Twitter. So they, they were doing it for me. And uh, once I got my name back, I called myself the real Linda DC so that everyone would know that that was really me. So that's my Twitter handle, my Instagram handle. It's just it's- Linda Urkelishan on Facebook. And it's Linda with a Y for everyone who wants to find you. And if there's any aspiring models in the DC area, the artist agency. Thank you. They can look you up. I really appreciate this. It sounds like you have a really fun night ahead of you. Yeah. What are you doing tonight? So, oh, and we need to, before we go, we have to take some pictures. Um, I am, believe it or not, working on this podcast. Like I have some other sit downs. And I'm just like, I I have to tell you, I've been working so hard now that we're in quarantine. Like, I mean, I've worked harder in life, but I, this is like the hardest I've worked in like a really long time. It's interesting. Like people think that we're off, but we're not like we have, we're working twice as hard because we've got to figure out the new way of doing things. That's what it is. And like, I want, I'm always like the type that like wants to try to look at the positive of everything. So like, I want to try to say like, these are all the things I had done that I never would have done because I was running a mile a minute, all of which is true. You know, I mean, I still was still doing the show, but I'm doing a lot of just, I'm, you know, I'm home. So I'm trying to get like a lot of things done just that I probably would have put off for another five years at this rate. So keep in touch everyone. The real Linda from the real housewives of DC. I love you much. Thanks David. Anytime. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to yet another episode of Behind the Velvet Rope. Because without you listeners, I would just be a crazy person with voices in my head. And if you like what you hear, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe on Apple Podcasts under Behind the Velvet Rope. And when you're done subscribing, feel free to leave a five-star write-up review because the write-up reviews actually count. We read each and every one of them. We post the best ones and the reviews really help our shows keep going. And we really appreciate everything you guys say, especially the positive ones. 
And if you want to find us online, we're at Behind Velvet Rope on Instagram. We are at David Yontef on Instagram. We're behind The Velvet Rope on Apple Podcasts. Or head on over to Patreon, because you know what? There are just some things we can't talk about here. So for our bonus episodes, go to Patreon and type in Behind the Velvet Rope. And if you still aren't sick of me and you want more David, go to Cameo and book me on Cameo. And you can ask me anything there. I'll answer whatever you want. And I have a bargain basement price of $10. Thank you guys. See you soon.